it was quite extraordinary, quite extraordinarily convenient that simply by scraping more data off the web, not necessarily clean data, right? Like messy data is just web data. You're just taking in everything. And there's tons of junk out there, but taking in a very noisy, messy, massive data set and just making the model bigger, you know, throwing some more chips at it. <laughs> and what came out the other side was something that understood language in a way uh, I personally thought we were, we were decades from. We're talking this week to Aiden Gomez, who helped develop the transformer algorithm, which lies at the heart of generative AI and powers large language models such as GPT-4. Aiden now leads a startup, Cohere, a platform that offers users access to pre-built LLMs, as well as allowing users to create their own LLMs. First, though, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor and encourage anyone with a business to take advantage of a deal from Oracle, which is offering a full NetSuite implementation with no down payment and no interest for six months. NetSuite is a cloud-based business management software for enterprise resource planning, financial management, customer relationship management, and e-commerce. To take advantage of the offer, go to netsuite.com backslash I on AI. That's netsuite, N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot com backslash E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. Now, let's get back to Aiden. I'm Aiden. I, uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cohere. I started the company with Nick and I in about three and a half, four years ago. Um, before that, I was kind of the perpetual intern at Google Brain during my undergrad and then later my PhD. I started down in the Bay Area in Mountain View. Um, and I was part of the team that created the, the Transformer. Uh, and it was incredibly exciting, you know. Um, it took the world by storm, I think, certainly to my surprise. And I think everyone on the team uh, was quite taken aback by, by its popularity. Um, but before Google, I was an undergrad, or also during Google, I was an undergrad at U of T. Um, I grew up in rural Ontario, Canada, in a uh, maple forest, uh, and so... I'm the world's most Canadian man. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's me. And, and so you were at uh, U of T, were you studying with Jeff Hinton? I guess uh, he yeah. was probably uh, kind of retired from teaching by then. He was definitely not teaching, uh, but he was still at the university. Uh, this is before the Vex Vector Institute was created. Um mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he was, you, you know, like I, I didn't really get into deep learning until after second year. And then when I started looking into it, I became obsessed and I was just reading papers night and day. I would fall asleep with a, a research paper sitting on my bedside. I would, in between sets at the gym, you know, have a stack of papers that I was reading through. Um, and I kept seeing this name <laughs> and his affiliation was U of T, which was where I was. Mm -hmm. And so I, I reached out to Jeff. This is before Google. Um, and I just, you know, I'd been reading his papers. I, at that point, I was studying, uh, uh, you know, Relu's and MLPs and just the most simple piece of the AI deep learning stack. And I was like, you know, why do you have these functions that are just mm -hmm. flat and then up? I think that they should be periodic. And so um, I emailed him with an idea being like, hey, why did you make this decision? Um, I think they should be periodic. There should be some regularity and uh, it should be bounded so that you know it doesn't go to infinity if we get a large input. Um, and to my surprise, he responded <laughs> and he actually explained the decision. Um, and so that was, that was pretty amazing. I, uh, that was my first interaction with Jeff. And then uh, when I came back from Google in Mountain View to Toronto, Jeff said, hey, come work with me uh, in 
in the Toronto Brain Office. And that was where I met my co-founder, Nick, uh, was nice. there. Um, and just on, uh, on so, so you, you worked on the Transformer algorithm with a team in Mountain View at Google. Google Brain, was it? Yeah, Google Brain, yeah. So can you explain that periodic versus uh, uh, stable or what, what, which algorithm are you talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not very important because I was wrong. Uh, so in some <laughs> sense, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really um, matter. And I think it's more just to Jeff's credit, the fact that he responded to a, a second year undergrad with, uh, yeah. you know, wacky idea earnestly. Um, and this guy was literally the top of his field. Uh, he yeah. had time. He had time for me. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that, that, that particular piece, that, I mean, maybe it's interesting. So for instance, in, in deep learning and neural networks, we have these neurons, uh, these neurons fire. There's some function mm -hmm. that determines their firing. There's some um, generally some threshold at which they don't fire, they stay dormant, and then above that they fire. And so when they're firing, um, they basically, they fire uh, linearly proportional uh, to the input intensity that they're getting. So if the mm -hmm. input intensity is high, the output intensity is high when they're firing. Um, but that leads to potentially unstable behaviors. If you have for whatever reason, some sort of uh, blow up or some sort of like burst of signal coming in, um, then you'll get a huge burst out and it'll, that'll propagate and make things more and more uh, noisy. And that leads to instability. It makes things complicated in, in training. And so my proposal was instead of just firing linearly proportional to your inputs, instead have some sort of predictable regular periodic pattern, like a you know, sine wave or something, um, so that you always know your output is bounded between some values. Um, but that has not taken off, and we've since solved the training instability and the blow-ups and that type of thing. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was just my first email to Jeff, I think, six months into my study of, of deep learning. Wow, that's impressive. And uh, from, from uh, Maple Forest... Uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I left that, but, uh, I go back, I go back often. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, then at Google brain, what was the project that you were working on? What was the initial, uh, idea, uh, that, that led to transformers? So I was on the infrastructure side, like the, the original idea I joined Google for, I was working with Lukash Kaiser. Um, and what we wanted to do, I, I think Lukash operates half a decade to a decade uh, ahead of his time constantly. And so the project that I joined for was actually this paper called One Model to Learn Them All. And the idea was we're going to take every single data set uh, that machine learning researchers have compiled and we're going to put it into one model. And that means it needs to be multimodal because we have data sets for images, we have data sets mm -hmm. for audio, video, you know, text, everything. And so what we wanted to do was throw all the modalities uh, in as well as out. So you can consume video and uh, let's say describe the video or you can consume audio and transcribe it. But you can also take in some text and then produce audio. You can also um, describe the video that you want and video comes out the other side. So it's just like fully multimodal on both input and output side. And we just train on everything, like truly everything we've, mm -hmm. we've come across. This now sounds kind of familiar, right? Because this is sort of the project roadmap that we're on right now with these big, yeah. large language models that we're throwing everything we have, the entire internet. Uh, and now we're starting to add in every modality that we can. Um, and so that was what I joined for. That was a, a different project altogether. To support that project, we built this we built this piece of software, this piece of infrastructure, um, because that model was going to have to be huge, and the data pipelines were going to have to be extraordinarily complex, um, and so we needed something to to suit that. Um, and so what we did was uh, created this 
program called Tensor to Tensor. Uh, it could distribute across arbitrary numbers of GPUs, like thousands and thousands and thousands. And it was very focused on autoregressive modeling, which is the type of modeling that the transformer is. And so at that time, I was sitting next to Noam, uh, who you know, was fiddling with uh, autoregressive models, and in particular, attention-based models. He was really interested in attention. And then we heard about a team over in Translate, which was being led by Jakob, um, which was also interested in attention-based autoregressive models. And so Lukash convinced Noam and, and Jakob you know, come over, build it on our stack, build it on Tensor to Tensor. Um, and they did. And so over the next, I think, 10 weeks, it was just a sprint to build this model. Uh, and the intensity just ramped up and ramped up because the results we were getting were extraordinary. Um, so I think this was like, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the very early, extremely successful scaling projects, like hyperscalable architectures, uh, massive data, massive model sizes, um, and massive GPU clusters just led to extremely high performance. And and the first of all, the tensor to tensor, uh, that's a framework or an orchestration level layer? Yeah, yeah. So it it's, it was built on top of TensorFlow at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it was basically just a library um, to support large, uh, large distributed model training. Um, and it had all the latest kind of tricks and hacks with learning rate schedules and uh, initialization techniques. And it had all this stuff built in. Um, and so it let us experiment really rapidly. Um, I, I think, if I'm being honest, Tensor to Tensor was a mess. It was crazy. It was just like all over the place. It supported everything. We were just throwing every new paper that was coming out into it. It, it was a little bit chaotic. Um, and there exists far, far better <laughs> systems nowadays. But back then, it, it did the job. It did the job. We were able to move insanely fast. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite proud of it. And uh, you, you were, attention was already something that was being talked about. Uh, I, well, a couple of questions. In that process, what was your role? Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm a journalist. I, I imagine you guys sitting next to each other furiously coding. I mean, were you coding or is it more that you're in a room with a whiteboard trying to figure out uh, the architecture or is it something else? There's a lot of like whiteboarding and um, diagrams and just conceptual um, structuring these building blocks and putting them together and um, thinking about the architecture itself. There, there was a lot of that. Um, and that was mainly done by Noam, uh, Shishniki, and, and uh, Jakob. Um, mm -hmm. I think for me, like I, I wasn't sleeping. I, <laughs> I was working like 14 hour days, coding, building up this infrastructure, making it more robust, running experiments. Um, and so it, it was very much hands-on. Um, coding. Uh, no one was sleeping. Everyone was just hacking, experimenting, running little tweaks, little ablations to see if I add this in, what changes? If I, if I remove it, if I tweak it, um, every single one of us was just messing with everything and <laughs> trying to figure out what was the optimal configuration. Um, and so that's how we got to that, that finished product. Yeah. And, and certainly, uh, the, the result now is leading to auto code generation. Were you using any tools to speed up the, the writing of the code? At that time, nothing existed. Um, no. Truly nothing, nothing existed. It was all, uh, you, you wrote it yourself. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, that came that came later, and that was powered by transformers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So they, they kind of enabled that. Yeah, and for for myself, I mean, I've read the paper and and certainly talked to a lot of people about transformers and uh, and their progeny. But uh, can you explain uh, as as in as simple terms as uh, as you can muster, what the transformer algorithm is and what it does, and I'm just curious too if I, if if you were to send me uh, the transformer algorithm, sort of the basic al- algorithm, is it a million lines of code? Is it twenty lines of code? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious what it looks like. Yeah, nowadays it's it's probably closer to. 20 um 20 lines of code uh extremely extremely simple um i think a big part of the beauty of the model the architecture was the fact that it was just so simple um like it it is among the simplest architectures (laughs) that were going around at the time it was just some like the the most basic layer, the layer that has existed for like uh, I don't know how many years now, maybe um, over half a century. Um, like the the basic layer is called like a MLP. Uh, that's just what it's called, MLP. Um, and really, the transformer is like the simplification, but it's just some MLPs stacked on top of each other, plus an attention layer. Um, and NLP, you're saying, like natural language M. process? M, no, okay. Michael. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is just, the name doesn't matter. Multilayer perceptron is the actual okay. acronym. But, um, Multilayer perceptron sounds like a neural deep net, but... Totally, yeah. That, that's the fundamental unit. Um, and before uh, before transformers, there were these very complicated LSTM architectures with gates and right. um, all of these like uh, confusing bits and bobs that just <laughs> made it made it work. Um, with the transformer, all of that was torn away, and the layer became MLP, MLPs plus one attention. That was it, um, and so that was that was super. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. That, that, that was a very. It was beautiful that you could just carve away so much stuff and just leave something so simple uh, that performed so well, that was so scalable. Um, so the the architecture is not this hyper complex beast. Uh, it's actually just a very simple, scalable, um, compute saturating, you know. Uh, Thing. Well, I- explain w- what it does. So you have the multi-layer perceptron as as the base. Uh, how do you create attention? How do you create attention? Yeah. So um, attention is like this idea that you want to relate parts of a sequence to other parts. It's mm-hmm. a fundamental property that there are relation, if you have a sequence of things, a thing in a list, in an order, um, there are going to be relationships between those things. Um, Obviously, that appears in language very, very strongly. You have uh, adjectives, which are tied to nouns, and, you know, tons and tons of structures like this. Um, And so since we were developing this explicitly for language, we wanted the model to be able to uh, represent those relationships quite easily. So that's what attention does. Attention says, for this word in this sentence, I'm going to learn which other words or which other word uh, in the sequence it's related to. And so for the sentence, the brown dog, um, you're going to want to learn that brown refers to dog. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the the refers to dog. so you're going to want to model those relationships and attention enables you to do just that. And it's not that simple. It's not just like the model is learning adjective noun relationships. It's learning far more complex stuff that we, we probably don't even have language to describe, uh, but we just do it intuitively in our heads. 
Um, so that like that attention layer is the fundamental unit of learning relationships in sequences. And it turns out to be extraordinarily powerful. And uh, how then d does that scale? Because I've spoken to Ilio on the podcast and he talks about seeing the paper and like the next day implementing it in, uh, in uh, what they were doing. Uh, that that led to the GPT models. Uh, how how do you how does that scale then into uh, the the large language models that we see today? In their earliest form, it was like a very naive scaling. It was just take it, take the model, and make it bigger. And the way that you do that is you add more neurons to the network. You add more layers, so it becomes, you know, a much taller model, much more deeply stacked. Um, and you just take a much larger data set than the one that we were considering and a much, much larger model than the one we were considering um, and a much larger pool of compute. You plug those all together and what comes out the other side, I think it shocked virtually everyone. Um, it was quite extraordinary, uh, quite extraordinarily convenient that simply by scraping more data off the web, not necessarily clean data, right? Like messy data, it's just web data. You're just taking in everything and there's tons of junk out there, but taking in a very noisy, messy, massive data set and just making the model bigger, you know, throwing some more chips at it. <laughs> and what came out the other side was something that understood language in a way uh, I personally thought we were, we were decades from. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite a extraordinarily convenient and um, exciting reality. So, uh, and, and that led to uh, Bert, is that right? Uh, that, that in particular, like Bert predated Oh, maybe I have them in the wrong order. There's some order. There's there's GPT-1, uh, which was the first of these scale-up large language model papers. Um, I think BERT predated GPT-1, I think. Um, but BERT is a different thing. BERT is kind of like a different beast. Um, instead of learning to generate language, uh, it learns to represent it. And that's a subtle distinction. Now, like, we're all paying attention to the generate side because it's so, it's visceral, right? It's like you can talk to these things. They can write back to you. It feels, there's a very visceral human reaction to something that can speak to you. Um, but there's another side to this whole thing, which is um, representing language in a numerical form. And that's extremely important. Uh, it's hard to overstate how significant um, that is. And that was like the first killer application of transformers. It was integrated into Google search and Google themselves uh, describe it as the, uh, the most significant advance in search quality in, uh, I think it was two decades, 20 years, like basically Google's entire lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was amazing. We got, we got something, we got a model, we got a, a program that was capable of representing language to be used downstream for applications like search um, and classification, uh, et cetera. Um, extremely, extremely faithfully, like in a, in a very, very high utility way, in, in a way that um, just boosted performance in a way we, we really uh, didn't expect across pretty much any tasks you threw at it. And anytime you wanted to use language for some downstream thing, um, putting a, a BERT model there and taking the representations from that and running with those representations, you, you beat state of the art. You outperformed everyone else. Um, so maybe, maybe BERT was like the first seed of this idea. We can take a transformer, we can set it against a very simple task on a very diverse set of data and what comes out is something that 
seems to get language. Like it seems to just get it. Um, if I'm right, that Bert predated GPT-1. I'm not sure mm -hmm. uh, that's true. Uh, you'll forgive me. I want to get to Cohere, but I, I, uh, I'm a layman. Uh, my uh, audience is somewhere in between me and and you. I mean, they're they're fairly sophisticated. But so you've got twenty lines of code. Uh, you feed it uh, some data. Let's say uh, a sentence. How is it? And and it's it's relating within the uh, neurons of the, or the perceptrons of the multilayer perceptron, it's relating one uh, piece of data, one word uh, to another word. H how is it doing that? Uh, does it, is it, uh, is it by feeding it uh, huge volumes of data that it begins to see patterns or within that 20 lines of codes, something incredible is happening. And I, I, can, is it possible to explain that? Um, I think it, it's not, it's maybe one line of code that leads to that behavior. Um, the other 19 are support. Um, I, I would say the one line is is the objective. Uh, it's like what you're asking the model to do with the data. You're feeding through this like hyper complex pool of data. Um, and what does it mean to feed it through? Uh, well, what you're actually doing is you're saying in the generative case, this is like the GPT style case, uh, you're asking it to given all the words up to a point in a sentence, predict the next one. And that sounds simple. It sounds like uh, stuff we've had for a while, which is like autocomplete, tab autocomplete, or um, no, it's like uh, that That objective is horrendously complex. Because if I give you, uh, on the internet, there's examples of translation, right? Like there's forums online where people teach each other how to speak different languages and someone asks, hey, how do I say uh, the brown dog in Spanish? Um, and then stop, and then the person responds, oh, you say it by... Uh, I don't know how to speak Spanish, but whatever it is, right? And so if you ask your model to model this, the, the only way for it to accurately model this, it has to know how to speak Spanish because it's seeing the English part saying, hey, how do I translate the brown dog into Spanish? Stop. And now I need to produce the Spanish translation. And so you can see like uh, just organically by learning to generate sequences in order, um, you're forced to learn extremely complex behaviors like translation, like classification, um, like writing code. Uh, you know, at the top of a piece of code, you'll have a function signature, you'll have a comment, a doc string saying, um, this function does X, Y, and Z, it takes these inputs of this structure and outputs the following. And then if you're gonna model that code, you, you have to learn to program because you're just given a function signature and then a doc string that humans wrote for other humans to read. And so I, I think one of the most beautiful things that falls out of this is um, using this very, very simple structure, which is just, here's a ton of data, uh, learn to generate it, learn to predict the next, the next token. Y you're, you think you're asking the model to do something quite simple and, and minimal. The reality is you're asking it to do an extraordinarily complex uh, task, set of tasks. Um, you're asking it to understand our culture, our, our language, the you know interactions between us. You're, you're asking it to understand that data at the deepest level. And so what you get out the other side is, is a model that you know roughly does understand and does have the capacity to do all that stuff, does understand our culture. Um, I think that's another one of these like beautiful simplicities. Such yeah. a simple objective. Such a simple objective. Pick, pick the next word. And what falls out of that, what you're actually asking it to do, it's so extraordinary. And when you're, so there's what, five of you working side by side 
how many people were working on the project? I think weren't there five or six names on the paper? I think there were, uh, there were eight or seven. Eight. Uh, yeah, but in any case, you're. It, it was there a moment, or did you know going in, just from whiteboarding, that wow, this this could work, or or was there a moment when you were, uh, you know, running tests that you began to see uh, these extraordinary results and knew you were onto something amazing? Yeah, there are definitely moments where like someone would come running over. Uh, from their desk and be like, yo, come look. Uh, and they had just run the e eval and it was like, it was state of the art. It beat everything that came before. Um, and then we would all be like, nice. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's keep pushing. And uh, the funny thing is it came together so quickly. It was really like over the span of three months. Um, this wasn't like a year long effort or anything like that. Um, it was this like super fast iteration pace. Um, I don't know if there was a moment, I, I really don't think anyone fully grasped the significance. Um, and that's mostly because the significance wasn't there at the time. Um, the significance came from the fact that people adopted it. They could have adopted something else. And they could have leaned into something entirely different. They chose a transformer for whatever sort of mimetic uh, effect led to that. But they chose a transformer. They started investing, the community started investing tons of time in building infrastructure and um, support all the way down to the hardware level for this particular architecture. And they enabled us to, us being the entire like AI community, to consolidate, consolidate on one architecture. Um, and so I, I've said this before, and I, I feel quite confident almost everyone on the paper would agree. Um, the, the transformer could have, it could have been another model. Frankly, it could have been another model. The transformer was just the simplest. It had the best support. Uh, and then the community reinforced that. Um, and the community made some sort of uh, uh, decision to consolidate on this architecture and really invest in it. And um, they made it a success. Um, it could quite easily have been another architecture that similarly scaled up well, saturated compute well. Do you, you think there are other architectures out there that could, that just haven't been discovered or explored? Uh, th that could lead to such dramatic results? Um, absolutely. Like, uh, unequivocally. I, I think uh, definitely uh, they exist. They're out there. Um, and with enough work and effort, maybe we could flip to another architecture, but we've already done half a decade of infrastructure development and um, software support and you know, writing highly optimized kernels for the, the hardware for transformers. And so there's a, um, there's like this resistance to moving. It, it would sure. take a lot of community will, willpower uh, to move away from the transformer. Um, and the only thing that would motivate that is like some new substantial breakthrough at the architecture level. Um, yeah, so I, I don't see that happening, but I, I also don't make the claim that like the transformer architecture is some like divine, uh, yeah, entirely unique piece of piece of software. I mean, right? pre presumably uh, these uh, large language models themselves could, uh, at some point, suggest other architectures. Yeah, right. people have wanted to use models uh, in that sort of like feedback loop. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's definitely, we're, we're already starting to see um, chip architectures being uh, decided by, by models. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, and so the chips uh, train the model and the model <laughs> change, you know, decides the next generation of the chip and there's, um, this feedback loop that 
Who yeah, who's sure. doing that? Uh, Google mostly. Their V four or five TPU chips were model uh, placed designed. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's that's exciting. That happens on a super slow time scale because it just takes so long to actually fabricate yeah. chips, push them out, verify them. Um, so that happens at too slow a time scale. The stuff that you're describing, like the architecture search uh, projects, I, I would say those have actually surprisingly been quite low yield. Um, and that's probably because humans have spent so much time on neural net architectures. They've explored that space so thoroughly um, and done a pretty, like, pretty compelling job at it. Um, and so when we threw models at it, they, like the gains were marginal always. Um, or, or they like rediscovered stuff that we had discovered previously and kind of missed. Um, and they just brought it to light. They surfaced it again. Um, so pe people have kind of tried that, but it seems like in architecture space, it's actually, uh, it seems to have been saturated or perhaps the methods used, this was also at Google, um, perhaps the methods used weren't the right ones. It's hard to say, but there, there was an effort to try to get models to produce new model architectures and have this self-improving feedback loop. And I would, I would say that it largely uh, fell flat. Hmm. Uh, so you, you went then from Google. Uh, tell me about how you started Cohere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I spent the better part of three years um, bouncing around. So I was in Mountain View for the Transformer, and then I went to Toronto, and Jeff said, hey, come, come and hang out at Google in, in Toronto. Um, and then I graduated from undergrad. I went to Oxford for my PhD. Uh, Jakob from the Transformer paper, he had actually decided to leave Mountain View and go back home to Berlin. And he was like, you know, I'm going to set up a brain office in Berlin. And so I was like, hey, that's pretty close, like a 40 minute flight from London. Um, let's work together. And so then I was on a plane every two weeks to Berlin to see Jakob and, and work there. Um, and eventually, eventually I, I just realized like there was a revolution kind of promised. Um, back when I was in Mountain View, just after we had released the Transformer paper publicly, um, Noam immediately started working on language modeling um, and scaling the models up. And he was like actually deeply involved in the GPT-1 paper. He was helping open AI with it. Um, and then I went back to Toronto and I got an email from Lukash and he's like, hey, um, have a look at this. And in that email, there was a Wikipedia article and the title was The Transformer. Um, and then I, so I was like, oh, hey, there's a Wikipedia article on this. Uh, I kept reading down and then it was a Japanese punk band and it consisted of these <laughs> members and this member had left. And, and, I, and I was just like, what the fuck? Like, Lukash, what is this? <laughs> and he was like, oh, The Transformer wrote this. I just put in the transformer as the title. Oh, Everything else. Wow. Is in the title. Um, wow. And that was just like, you're kidding. Me. Like it was like surreal. It was just like, you, you know, you went to bed one night and models could barely spell. And then you woke up the next morning and they were writing as fluently as a, like such a plausible story about a Japanese punk band called the transformer. Um, and I, uh, I think that was like the moment that I was like, okay, this unlocks in product space, this unlocks something categorically different. Like it just, uh, something extraordinary. Um, and I thought it was going to happen and I, I waited and I waited and I, you know, I was doing my PhD and I was pu putting out new research and proving fundamental methods. And, um, after three years there, nothing had changed. The, the world was the same. Um, and Nick and I, even my co-founders, like, I think we all felt the same disappointment. 
no, nothing had changed. We, we saw something magical three years ago and nothing had changed. No one's talking about it. Um, and so eventually that disappointment turned into um, resolve to, to do it ourselves. And so we decided, okay, let's leave um, and let's go build Cohere to bring this to the world. This is before GPT-3, uh, just after GPT-2 in, in 2019. Um, and back then the mission was really just, A, this is the most amazing technology uh, that humans have ever created. Um, let's model the web. Let's build a model of the entire internet. Um, and B, let's put it into the hands of every single developer on earth. Um, and let's inject it into every single product and just create a new generation of magical product experiences. Um, so that, that was really the seed. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> so Cohere uh, is uh, at, at its core, a large language model or a suite of models and uh, for different vertical tasks or, or what describe what, what it is and, and how people use it. <clears throat> yeah. So at its core, yeah, it's like a, we're a uh, intelligence factory building these big models, uh, making them as usable, as usable, as useful uh, as possible. Um, there are like a suite of models. We have both sides of that coin that I was describing before, where there's the generative and then representation. So BERT style is representation and GPT style is the generative side. So we have both of those and we build them in-house. Um, the way that we bring them to the world is that we partner with enterprises uh, and we solve really what, what are some of the today's largest blockers for adoption. Um, which are privacy, uh, privacy blockers, data compliance blockers. If you're really going to put these large language models into useful applications at the forefront of your product, they're going to be touching data that's um, the most sensitive, like user data, right? Like people's private data. Um, and so that puts a very, very high security bar. Um, so for us, one of the benefits of being independent, uh, our competitors mostly are sort of bound to one cloud provider. Uh, there's exclusivity there. Um, for us, being independent means we can play with everyone and with the enterprises that use us, they don't get vendor lock-in. So they're not trapped into one cloud provider. Um, they can bounce between and we can deploy wherever they go. Um, so Furco here, one of our core efforts right now is making it so that these models can be deployed on any cloud provider uh, in situations where the data is the most sensitive because that enables the most interesting and impactful applications. Otherwise, you, you kind of get what I've been seeing a lot of recently, which is superficial deployments of these models. Like not real, not, not product changing, not like fundamental shifts uh, in infrastructure, but more like, here's my product and I'm just tagging it onto the side and here's right. like an auxiliary experience. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense given the fact that this year everyone just kind of like woke up. And so, um, it's going to take a while to actually replace this with the, the thing that we want. Um, so it makes sense, but really the piece that's blocking this is the fact that there's not a lot of trust uh, in some of our competitors due to the fact that in the past they've trained on their user data and they've disintermediated people. Um, and so for us, we want to regain that trust and be the trusted partner for enterprise to actually bring large language models into a, like a truly transformative way. Um, mm. So I think there's like right now, there's a product transformation that's kind of simmering under the water because the whole world just woke up. Every single company now is trying to figure out what, what does this mean? What does this technology mean for my product, my experience? What are my users, my the consumers? What are they gonna expect from me? How do I not get left in the dust by my competitors who are gonna reinvent their product 
uh, on the back of this technology. Um, and so they're starting to do the work. Like there's in 18 months, the product space is going to look completely different because right now everything is shifting behind the scenes. Um, and so for Cohere, we really want to power that transformation and be a, a trusted partner um, mm. to the largest enterprises and uh, the best developers on earth. And, and enterprises spans uh, the gamut of industrial verticals, or are you focused on one industry? It's totally, totally horizontal. So it, it impacts everything. Um, yeah, like I, I think you're going to be doing your banking with a conversational agent. You're going to be doing your shopping with a conversational agent. I think it's really hard to think of a particular vertical or industry that's that doesn't need to be changed by this because consumer expectations are going to be there's going to be this inter when i show up to this new product there's going to be this interface that i expect which is language um so with these interface level changes and in the same way that if you're a, a product or a service you have to have a mobile app because everyone's on their phones and that's you know how they want to interact um with products and services in that, in that same way that that mobile transition led to everyone having to support this interface that the consumer expected, everyone is going to have to support conversation and dialogue with an intelligent agent as an interface onto your products and services. So there's like this resurfacing of product space that is literally happening right now. Is there an example uh, without naming names that you can give that you think is going to blow everybody away? I mean, I, it's no secret. It's no secret that we're starting to see some very compelling uh, assistant like mm -hmm. offerings. Um, there were the promises with Siri and, and Google Assistant and Alexa that came 10 years ago or whatever it was. Um, and those fell flat. And I think the technology like, truly just was not there to support it. Um, there is now the possibility of a truly general assistant. Um, like we actually have the technological bedrock to support that. And it's emerged. How? It's, I'm sorry? It's, it's emerged recently. It's a fairly recent development that that has been unlocked as a thing you could plausibly build. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I talked to Ilya about uh, RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback, as a way of kind of guiding the model toward more grounded responses. Uh, but I've talked to other people who say uh, that's still speculative. Uh, and and takes a lot of time, and they're they're using vector databases uh, and loading vector databases with authoritative uh, data, and then the language model in effect is just the uh, the mouthpiece. Uh, it's okay. it's not uh, it's it's not calling up the answers from its accumulated knowledge. It's referring to this vector database. How do you guys deal with hallucinations? Um, yeah, I, there's like, there's someone, Sarah Hooker at Cohere. I, she said this before and I, I really, I really like it. Um, you have to distinguish between the hallucinations that you want, which are like creativity and the hallucinations that you don't want it. Like, it's great when it hallucinates a story or a new joke or, you know, um, you want that. And so you, you don't want to like beat that ability, that capability out of the model. Um, at the same time, you need ways to control it. So for instance, um, if you're doing knowledge gathering or research, you definitely don't want anything made up. There's like almost zero tolerance for um, hallucination. And so you, you kind of want a gradient 
or a, a parameter that you want to set, uh, which might be the creativity parameter. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's becoming increasingly possible. Another, another really good way to get models to be more truthful is to actually force them to cite their work. Um, so there's uh, Patrick Lewis. He was the first author at Meta uh, on creating RAG. It's called Retrieval Augmented Generation. And so that, that's this idea that you have a model uh, and you have an external knowledge base, or maybe multiple external knowledge bases. Maybe one's Google, one's your private emails, one's your blah, blah, blah. Um, and what the model can do is it can go out and it can query these sources. So it can say, hey, the user just asked me about this. I think I should query Google. Uh, and then it gets back from Google some documents or it gets back from your email, whatever emails you're looking for. And then now that it can read those, it can generate a response. And it can cite back to them. It can say, hey, you asked me this. I think this is the answer because of this sentence inside of this document or this web page. Um, by forcing the model to learn to cite its sources, you get two things. One is the fact that you can actually check its, um, you can verify it, right? Like you can check that it's mm -hmm. telling the truth. You click into that link, you can read the thing and you can say, uh, it lied. Uh, or you can say, oh no, it's right. Yeah, uh, you know, that checks out. Um, so one is you get it to cite its sources. Uh, the other thing is that you force a behavior, you reinforce a behavior into the model of um, not making claims without grounds to those claims. And so it starts to learn these scenarios where, you know, when I'm writing stories, I, I don't really need to cite sources. I, I just need to write and the user is happy and content and, you know, I get mm -hmm. a good, good reward. Um, and in the scenario of, hey, I'm doing research on a topic. Can you tell me about X? It starts to learn, okay, shit, in this case, I need to have a very rigorous bibliography. I need to be able to tie that back. And if I mess up, if the user clicks through and sees a, an error or a hallucination, I'm going to get a super strong negative feedback. And so it learns to differentiate between these scenarios. Um, so I, I really do believe retrieval augmentation uh, is going to be one of the key pieces of, uh, along with human feedback, it's going to be one of the key pieces of making these models more reliable, more grounded. That's fascinating. Uh, I, I, I'm coming up to an hour. Can I ask a few more questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got to ask this, you know, this uh, has set off uh, sort of the public release of ChatGPT uh, has set off this debate about um, how dangerous these models can be. Uh, to everyone's surprise, uh, Jeff has gone public saying some really dire things, uh, which, uh, you know, I've, I don't know him like you do, but I've known him for a while, and it's uh, it, it, it surprises me. I've never heard him speak that darkly about uh, something do you have a view on that? That's one question. And then the other is this debate about uh, sentience or uh, self-awareness. I mean, you've you had your fingers in the in the brain of of these things. Do you do you think that sentience or self-awareness could really emerge or do you think that uh you know these are uh, bits of code and it's all an illusion uh, there's, there's a lot to say uh that <laughs> we, we need we need another hour or two together to properly represent my beliefs uh around that question i, I sure. think the first part for jeff um Jeff is like, uh, Jeff went through the same thing that I think many of us in the field went through where our timelines got pulled forward massively. And so it, you know, we thought we'd have models that could write compelling English in a few decades. And then suddenly it shows up a, a year later. Um, 
And so that throws you into this state of shock and uncertainty. Um, and you're, you're quite caught off guard. Uh, and he's spoken about this, I think, publicly. Um, mm -hmm. The, the, the sen sentiment of, of surprise at, at progress uh, and rate of change. Um, I, I remember having conversations with him myself where both of us were kind of like, these people who talk about AGI, uh, you know, what nonsense, ha ha ha. <laughs> and this was back when models could, you know, barely spell. Um, but then you, you kind of get surprise and shock and your, your uncertainty blows up. And sometimes that can have the effect that, okay, anything's possible. Oh my God. Like I, I was so far off on that, that now I am shooting out my uncertainty across all anything could be possible. Super intelligent God. Okay. Maybe that's even possible. So I think like a lot of folks, um, we're all reckoning with that and recalibrating, um, and, uh, you know, adjusting our, our own timelines and understandings of, of progress and pace. Um, Jeff is extraordinarily thoughtful and he's been thinking about this since, at least the beginning of Cohere, so at least the last three and a half years, he's been thinking about this very, very deeply. Um, and so I, I think people should take him very seriously. Um, I think there will be a lot of uh, sensationalism um, and a lot of extrapolation from what he's saying. But if you actually listen to what, what he's actually saying, it's quite a measured, he's like, I'm highly uncertain about what can happen. And that means we should take this stuff seriously um, because we just don't have, you know, certain bounds. We don't have certainty around the future. And so we should be taking all the different possibilities quite seriously, not saying that they're likely to happen, um, but just saying that we they can't be ruled out yet. And so let's take them very seriously. Um, I think there's a lot of journalistic takes and headlines and clickbait and um, nonsense. Um, but if you actually listen to Jeff, uh, I think his take is quite measured and, and reasonable. Um, and, 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 and actually, I'd love to have you back on to talk at length about these things, but on the idea of uh, sentience or the illusion of sentience, uh, I mean, you you know more than almost anybody having built these models both what they're capable of and and what's uh, behind their expressions. Um, do you, do you think that? I mean, it's a philosophical question about what what sentience or consciousness is. Uh, whether it's you know whether our consciousness is just uh, an emergent property from the neural activities of our brain and, and, uh, and it's largely illusion. I mean, I have to just, <laughs> what would you say to all of that? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I don't place like a divinity on, on humanity. Um, I think that consciousness is in the brain uh, and it is like a physical process. Um, and it's maybe like maybe consciousness is what computing feels like, like what processing feels like. Um, and if that's the case, it's really hard to argue that that same phenomena um, couldn't be present in silicon. Um, yeah. I think you'd really have to, I think there has to be a leap, right? To say that the circuits in our brain, um, because they're human or because they're biological, have some sort of um, fundamental distinction. Uh, I, I think you really have to take a leap of faith there. And so if I'm just being pragmatic and reductive, uh, <laughs> Again, we would need two hours to discuss this, I think, more completely. But um, I think it'd be really, as, like, just as a scientist, I think it'd be really hard for me to say 
there's no way these machines could become sentient. I just, I can't construct an argument that ends at that. Um, yeah. 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 Well, uh, let's leave it there, but, uh, can, can I get a promise that you'll come back, uh, you know, in a few months and we can go deep on that subject? Yeah. yeah. I'd love to. Let's yeah. See. Okay. Uh, yeah, Aiden, this has been really fascinating. I'm delighted. Um, and I'm sure you heard uh, at uh, the MIT Tech Review Conference, uh, somebody asked Jeff, he was on uh, virtually from the UK, but somebody asked him whether he would divest himself of uh, yeah. Cohere. <laughs> and he said, no, no, he's he's going to stay invested. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a funny question. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate your time, and uh, and we'll talk again. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Aiden for his time. I also want to remind you to check out NetSuite, Oracle's business management software for enterprise resource planning, financial management, customer relationship management, and e-commerce, among other things. Go to netsuite.com, that's N-E-T-S-U-I-T-E dot C-O-M, backslash I on A-I, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together, to take advantage of this offer. And remember... The singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world, so pay attention. <laughs> <laughs>